Well, hello and welcome. Um, I have 7 p.m. on the dot Eastern time, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to today's Social Psychology Lab. Uh, my name is Megan Testerman, and I am a psychology and counseling librarian, the psychology and counseling librarian for Walden. Um, and today I'm joined by Sarah Prince from the Writing Center. Sarah, would you like to say hi? Hello, I am Sarah Prince. I am manager of writing across the curriculum at Wal Walden's Lab. Uh, excuse me, Walden's Writing Center. Thank you. Um, so I'm so glad to see so many of you join us today. Um, before we get started, just a few housekeeping things. Um, we do have captioning available for today's presentation. You'll find the um, the captioning link in the chat box. Um, you can just click on that link and it will open up another browser that has um, the captioning as we proceed. If you're watching this as a recording, um, we also have transcripts available of all of our webinars at the library and also I believe at the Writing Center. Um, if you need a transcript for any of our recordings, please just send us an email and let us know and we'll get that to you right away. A um, couple other things, handouts, there is a copy of today's slide presentation available in the handout section of GoToWebinar's user interface. Um, you can just download it. We are going to be recording today's session and then tomorrow you should all receive a, um, an email with a link to the recording so you can watch this again if you need to. Um, so let's dig into our content for tonight. Um, what Sarah and I are going to try to do for you all tonight is really walk you um, step by step through this assignment for your term paper for social psychology. So just as a quick recap of what we're looking at for this assignment, um, you are being asked to select and describe a social problem in your field of interest. Uh, you'll then need to explain why you selected the social problem. Uh, you're going to need to research at least five journal articles related to that social problem. And then you're going to need to look for two gaps that are in the literature that are related to your social problem um, that you could possibly use to explore further research. Um, and then you'll need to justify how you identified these two gaps. Um, and then lastly, through a social psychology lens, you're going to need to develop a research question that a social psychologist might use to conduct research. So today, the way this is going to kind of go is that um, I'm going to start out by giving you kind of a library presentation. I'm going to talk about how to find that gap. I'm going to show you um, how to find those five articles, how to find literature. Uh, I'm going to give you an example of kind of a, a research question example, and then I'm going to go over to the library databases and I'm going to give you a really practical demonstration in how to take a topic and narrow it down to find a gap. Then I'll uh, hand it over to Sarah, who's going to be talking um, from the Writing Center perspective, and she's going to help you um, define and identify scholarly writing identify scholarly writing foundations such as paraphrasing, analysis, and synthesis. And then she's also going to talk about how to correctly format, format APA references and citations. So um, let's get into how to find a gap and get into our content. So I have created for you a how to find a gap in five easy steps. I'm going to hopefully walk you through this process and give you some examples. So the first thing that we want to do for this particular assignment is that we need to identify a social problem that is significant to the field. So let's say, for example, that I might be interested in bullying. So that's where we're going to start. Now, bullying is a really, really broad topic. And if we were to go into the databases and just type in bullying, we would probably get tens of thousands of results. So that's really far from a gap. So how do we start narrowing that down towards um, the end to get to the end of where the literature is? So step two, we're going to start using exploratory research to examine the current research in the field. And at this point, there will be lots and lots of research and students tend to kind of panic at this point. It's not necessary, you're exactly where you need to be. So three, we're gonna to start to narrow down your area of interest um, by using narrower terms and defining concepts. 
So for example, if we take our bullying uh, example here, we could start to narrow down that population a little bit. So right now we're looking at bullying in all contexts. Maybe we can narrow that down by just looking at bullying and adolescence. So four, now we can start to look at what the literature covers and more importantly, what it doesn't. So here we're starting to get hit up against that edge of the current research and we're looking for opportunities to kind of take it further. So let's say, for example, our bullying and adolescence example, we could add to that bystander effect and see what the literature is out there about that and see if we can find some good leads for further research. Five, this is the point where we start to look for opportunities to build on existing research. So for example, we might wanna look at populations that have been under-researched, variables that haven't been explored, or we could even really type in, into the database, further research into a search field. And what that'll do is it will pull up any research articles on your topic that have suggestions for further research. That's a really great way to point yourself towards a gap. So for example here, we might find once we get in there that bullying and adolescence and bystander effect and student teacher relationships is a gap. So there's just, there's a lot of information on bullying and adolescence and maybe some information on bullying and adolescence and bystander effect, but there's very little research on all of that plus student teacher relationships. So that's how we can start to narrow down our area of interest and identify that gap. Now I'm gonna kind of break this down for you just so you can see the levels of research that we're accessing. So when we type in bullying, we're gonna see you know tens of thousands of articles. Bullying in adolescence, we might get, eh, we might get a couple thousand results. If we type in bullying and adolescence and bystander effect, we should probably get about 100 articles and here's where we're, things are getting interesting. And then if we type in bullying and adolescence and bystander effect and student teacher, oops, teacher relationships, that should be around 10 articles. So all of this literature, the, the question should kind of be, you know, where are you going to find those five articles? At what level of literature are you going to find those five articles to include in your paper? Well, we want to kind of aim for right here. We want to get right at that level that's really close to our gap, but it's just kind of one level up. That's going to be, you know, the, the bedrock of research and literature that we're going to pull those five articles from. These are going to be the, the articles that are going to provide the best argument for, um, for saying that this topic is significant to the field, but also being able to demonstrate that there is a lack of research on your particular gap that you've identified. So once we went through this process, then we could start to create a research question. So in this case, our research question might be something like, how do student-teacher relationships influence the bystander effect in instances of peer victimization or bullying? So here's our, our gap, and that, that could be something that we could take research further. So let's switch over to the library, and I'm going to show you how to do this. So here we are in the library, and the first place that I wanna show you is the Psychology Research Home. So on the library homepage, if you go to select a subject, you'll see from the drop-down menu, Psychology. And when you get to this page, you are on kind of the one-stop shopping psychology resources page. This is everything that the library has um, related to your field all on this one page. So it would be a really great idea to bookmark it. In fact, I'm going to copy the link and I'm gonna put it in the chat box for you so that you can have it. Um, but we have here, we have psychology databases, we have journals, uh, we have our tests and measures databases. Um, we have some fantastic databases that are of just videos. If you wanna see, for example, psychology experiments, live, you can go check out those. We have some books, including the DSM-5. This is where the DSM-5 lives. Um, and then below that, we actually have some research help. So these are resources, and then this is all research help um, on everything from you know basics, which a lot we're gonna talk about today, 
Um, and then if you need help finding a test or finding a theory, uh, we have some pretty in-depth guides down here. But for today and for this particular assignment, what we're going to use to start our search, to kick our search off, is this search box on the psychology research homepage. Now we're gonna use this because this particular search box on the psychology research homepage has been set up to search all of our databases and journals that have anything to do with psychology. So you can think of this as um, you know, a, a shortcut to searching just what's going to be relevant to your field. Now, it doesn't search everything in the library, but it will get you some really relevant results for psychology topics. So let's try our example. Let's try the bullying example and click the search box. Okay, so here we are in a really very broad search um, on bullying. And as we expected, it did bring up tens of thousands of articles. Now, the first thing that we want to do before we start building this search out a little bit is to make sure that we refine our results that are over here in the left-hand column. So for this example, I'm going to, or for this assignment, I'm going to encourage you to keep that full text limiter checked. Um, because you're doing this for a class assignment and because all of the literature that you access, you're going to need to be able to read um, and have immediate access to the full text um, so that you can include it in your paper. So let's keep that full text box checked. And then I want you to also check the peer-reviewed scholarly journals box. Now, your assignment did not specifically mention that you need these five articles need to come from um, peer-reviewed journals, but I would highly, highly recommend that you do. It's just a good practice to be in to use that, um, that really good resource, which is a peer-reviewed um, scholarly article to talk about any kind of academic subject and any kind of academic writing. So let's make sure that we have those two boxes checked, full text and peer reviewed. Um, if we want, we could even bring this publication date up just a little bit so that we're not getting um, articles from the 1880s. Okay, so now that we've done that, we have 35,000 results. So still way, way, way too big to start looking for a gap. So let's start to, to flesh this search out a little bit more. Now, I chose the word bullying just because that was kind of what came to mind. Um, but another word for bullying is peer victimization. So a way that I could kind of include that term um, into the search to kind of wrap those two up together would be to just type in or bullying or peer victimization. Okay. So now what that's going to do is it's going to tell the database, please bring back articles that talk about bullying or peer victimization. So we're at 35,000. Let's see what this does to our search results. Okay, so now we have 39. And that's to be expected because the or limiter is actually an expander. So what it does is it will bring back more results. But you know, you might really need to see those articles that are talking about peer victimization. So even though you have more articles at this point, you're still well within the realm of your topic. Okay, so now we have almost 40,000 results. We're gonna to have to start figuring out how to narrow that down. So let's start by narrowing down our population. So adolescents, oops, yep. So adolescents, um, and let's see what that does to our search. I think I, Adolescence, here we go. Don't know why that word looks so funny to me all of a sudden. Okay, so now we've narrowed it down to 13,000. That's getting better. So now we're, we're starting to figure out how to work with this topic and narrow it down. Um, so what were our other ideas for narrowing this down a little bit? Let's go back to our, okay. So let's try to add in a specific, a specific, um, aspect of this phenomenon. So let's type in bystander effect. You know, now earlier when I was kind of looking this up on my own, you know what I did was I actually started with bullying and adolescence, and I just scrolled through these articles until I found 
um, an article that mentioned bystander effect. And I thought that is really interesting. Like I would be curious to see, um, you know, how this all plays out together. And that was how I chose that as my keyword was that I really did just scroll through here and look for ideas. Um, and that's absolutely something that you can do as well. So let's see what happens to our search when we add in bystander effect. Okay, now we have 73. Um, and that's about what we thought we were going to get at this point. We thought we'd have about 100 articles. Um, and again, what I did at this point was I really just, I scrolled through here and I saw some subject headings for things like teacher-student interaction. And I thought, oh, that might be interesting. Let's see what that looks like. So I typed in student-teacher relationship and click search. Okay, now I have two. So this is clearly where the edge of the current research is. And this is also clearly an opportunity for further research, which is a gap. Um, so we can have a look at the two articles that come back up. All right, so this one's in Sweden. Um, this one is talking about um, this topic through a lens of self-determination theory. Um, you know, you might want to try a different approach, um, but you could use this to kind of justify um, that bullying or peer, peer victimization is a topic that is significant to the field because we saw so much research on that topic um, of just bullying in adolescents that that's going to give us justification that um, the topic is significant to the field and then you're going to demonstrate that but there is a gap and there is this one you know, aspect of this phenomenon that hasn't been explored, and that is how does student-teacher relationships affect bullying among adolescents and the bystander effect. Um, now, you could always kind of play with these and come up with different search terms um, to get at what you're looking for. Um, so much of searching in the database really is kind of just playing with terms um, to see, you know, what kind of re results you get and um, just doing trial and error. So feel free to play with these or to just experiment a little bit. You know, if student-teacher relationship wasn't working very well, maybe you could try teacher-student interaction. Um, or maybe you could look at, you know, parenting or something else that's related to that topic. Um, so I hope I have kind of given you a, a bit of a roadmap for how to start with your topic narrow it down, um, look at the edges of those of that research, find that gap, and then, you know, that level that we were talking about that you will pull your literature from is this one. It's the, the one that's just above the gap when you have a good 73. And if you don't find five articles out of the 73, take one more word off and then pull it from here. And then just keep mining down until you hit that gap. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. I'm going to turn things over to Sarah. I'm going to change presentation um, presenters, if you'll give me just a moment. And then Sarah, if you've got your PowerPoint ready. Okay, I do. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, I can see. Okay. All right, let me just put this in presentation mode. All right. Uh, so just as Meg was talking about research and how that's important for this assignment, the other piece of this is really um, scholarly writing and making sure that you have incorporated not only tone and objectivity, right, but also that you synthesize those five articles to really determine a gap and also rationale for your problem. And I know everyone's favorite topic is to discuss APA citations and references because those are uh, an important part of all academic papers you submit here at Walden. <clears throat> Okay, so what I really wanna focus on, and Meg covered this at the beginning, is to address uh, those foundations of scholarly writing. Those include paraphrasing, analysis, and synthesis. We call those in the Writing Center the building blocks of scholarly writing. And also to address APA references and citations, especially with journal articles, since you will be using some of those in your uh, term paper. So what is scholarly writing? Students come to me all the time and they say, you know, I'm just not a good academic writer. I just don't feel like I um, can convey myself 
um, or convey meaning the way I read in the journal articles that I'm looking at. I feel like I'm not um, as scholarly or as formal. And I always tell those students that first, not everything you read, not everything that's published is quality scholarly writing. And second, scholarly writing, just like riding a bike or long division, really takes a lot of practice. But once you've mastered it, it kind of becomes um, pretty simple to, to do. Um, there are four key components to scholarly writing. The first is to um, the, the first is your purpose. So you really are talking to other scholars. So in creative writing, your readers are a little bit more general, right? But um, you are talking to scholars or practitioners in your field in scholarly writing. You also generally have an argument, right? And this is not an argument based on your personal opinion. It's not even an argument based on your experience alone. It's not an argument based on assumptions. These academic arguments should always be based on credible outside evidence. And uh, Meg referenced in her presentation the importance of peer-reviewed journals. When we say credible outside evidence, we generally mean um, you know, peer-reviewed journals or books even government websites, those things that are credible because they have been peer reviewed or there is some sort of review process. In addition to purpose, tone and word choice is important. Uh, so we say that you should be formal, clear, and direct. However, that doesn't mean that you need a lot of what I like to call those $3 words. So those long, nice sounding words that make you feel, you know, I've used a, a four syllable word three times in the sentence. I feel like this is a pretty solid academic sentence. But the truth is, um, a lot of times those $3 words have vague meanings or they don't quite capture your meaning as well as saying it directly. Um, and so it can create sort of vague, abstract terminology that doesn't really convey what you're trying to convey. Um, I know we've all sort of been in those situations where we're trying to read journal articles or we're trying to read book chapters for an assignment. And it's really just hard to follow what the author is saying because it is so dense um, and so packed with jargon and terminology we don't quite follow. And generally, we think of that as, as you know, not great scholarly writing, that writing that makes us want to go, you know, clean toilets or do laundry, just do anything, right? So we don't have to keep reading that article. So you don't want your writing to be like that. You want to be formal, clear, and direct. And that does mean that you'll have fairly simple sentence structure most of the time. What I tell students is that you have complex ideas, yes, but the mark of a good writer is to take those complex ideas and to write them in sentences that are easy to understand. Um, and accessible to your readers. Now, we talked a little bit about objectivity, right? You want to make sure that your argument is evidence-based, that you're using credible evidence to support your argument. So really, you can argue just about anything as long as you have credible outside evidence to support those claims that you're making. You also want to be sure to avoid generalizations. And so this is things like, um, you know, most writers agree that APA is the best method or um, even things like recently the CDC found uh, words like most and recently are helpful in conversation, but they're not entirely, or they're not too specific, right? So my definition of most writers might be dif different than your definition of most writers, just like my definition of recently might be different than your definition of recently. So thinking about language and making it as specific as possible uh, is really important in academic writing, and it certainly makes your argument and your writing as a whole stronger. And then finally, APA. I know a lot of students think that APA has been created just to sort of exist as a thorn in their side and to give them headaches and make them graduate with less hair than they came into the university with. But the truth is, APA is really useful. Um, it, it creates a common language, right, for all of us at Walden. So, and all of us, frankly, in the social science field. So we cite sources, we have the same style, the same formatting. And what that allows readers to do is really actually focus on your content instead of focusing on the credibility of your sources. Um, if you have the citations that are appropriate, if you have the references that are there, I can trust that this is a quality and well-researched piece of um, research. So before we go on, I just want to do a quick little knowledge check. Um, and you're welcome to submit answers in the questions box or just think on your own about these um, pieces of writing. But these are two examples of good writing, but they just don't happen to be scholarly writing. So based on what we just learned about the four sort of tenets of good scholarly writing, why is this first example not a great example of scholarly writing? 
and I'll read it out loud. Um, most members of college boards believe that higher education costs too much, but a majority also say their own institution's prices aren't the problem. According to a survey on higher education, governance released on Thursday by the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges. So anyone want to take a stab in the questions box um, indicating why they think uh, this is not a fantastic example of scholarly writing? Okay, it looks like nobody wants to take a stab at it. So, oh good, one person said no reference and that's absolutely correct. Um, so for instance, this is um, highlighting the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges. That is true, but we need a reference, right? Supporting what year that is located in. It looks like they might be using footnotes here. You'll see that teeny tiny blue one up at the um, top of the S in colleges, but APA doesn't support the use of footnotes, so it's not in APA style. Um, it's too vague, someone says. Yes, we've got those generalizations like most members of college boards, right? It would be nice if they'd be more specific. Um, and then we have notions of higher education costs too much, but we don't have specifics about costs. So a range of costs might be helpful um, and provide a bit more clarity. In addition, we have contractions. Uh, so you'll see aren't the problem. Uh, per APA guidelines, you want to avoid contractions in your writing. Um, luckily, there's always an easy way to fix those contractions, which is just to write out both words. So here is another example. A college's decision to jump on the Coursera bandwagon is aided and eased by knowing that academic heavyweights like Harvard, Stanford, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology are already on board. As one college president described it to the New York, New York Times, quote, you're known by your partners and this is the College of Cardinals. So does anyone want to take a stab at why this might not be a good example of scholarly writing? Good, there's, there's no clarity in terms of who is making this claim. So again, there's no citation again here. Yes, and someone hit on non-academic terminology and that's really important. So you'll see in here, we've got the Coursera bandwagon uh, and then later uh, the author or the writer refers to academic heavyweights um, and you wanna be careful in your writing to avoid metaphors like this, right? We're not literally talking about a heavyweight and we're not literally talking about a bandwagon. So we have metaphors here. And the problem with metaphors is, again, people understand metaphors differently or they might not understand them at all. So in order to be as clear, concise, and direct as possible as writers, we really wanna avoid the use of metaphors. We also have a direct quotation here and we do not have you know, an author, page number, or year of publication. So that that's missing. And you'll notice that the New York Times is cited. Now granted, the New York Times is, is a fantastic publication, but it's not necessarily a peer-reviewed publication. So these are all important um, issues to highlight. Now this is not to say that, again, both of these examples aren't great writing. The truth is that they are. They've been published in a news magazine and um, a weekly newspaper. So they're published writing, but, but they are not academic writing. So understanding genre is really important um, and making sure that your, again, your phrasing is clear, concise, and direct is, is key. So it's also important to um, acknowledge that scholarly writing is an iterative process. So it's not a one-shot deal, right? You're not gonna sit down or you're not gonna, you might, but you're not gonna produce the best writing if you decide to sit down um, on Sunday, right? At 12 p.m. or maybe even later, right? Maybe Sunday at 7 p.m. and say, all right, I need to get through this pre-writing, drafting, revising and reflection process so I can submit this final term paper by 11.59 p.m. tonight. 
Now, I know no one in this room would ever do that, but occasionally we all, you know, we all have busy lives. We've got responsibilities outside of, of Walden. So sometimes it happens that we're kind of working at the last minute. But the problem with writing as a one shot deal is that you really have to build in time to revise and reflect. And you cannot do that all in one sitting. So students tell me frequently, well, I just don't have time, right? I don't have the time to go through all these steps on different days. But the truth is it doesn't actually take more time. It just requires you to space out your time. So I always suggest students break up the writing process into manageable chunks. Um, so for instance, one chunk might be um, to do research and pull two articles. Then the next day you might pull two more articles or the next day you might, you know, read those two articles and take notes, etc. So you've just sort of outlined this for yourself in a way that makes sense. And then when you draft, you can kind of step away from your draft, right? Um, and then go back to your draft later. And that really helps in terms of giving yourself perspective, sort of seeing ideas that you missed. I know we've all had these occasions where we write something, we think it's great or at least decent, right? And we come back and read our writing the next day and we think, what was I talking about? This makes no sense. And that's not unique to you, that happens to everybody because no one writes a perfect draft the first time around. So building in the time to pre-write, and that looks like, you know, whether that's brainstorming ideas, creating an outline, building a thesis statement, and then also building in that time for drafting, knowing that your first draft should never be your last draft, revising and proofreading from everything, looking you know, at organization and structure to going back and looking at Senate structure. Are my you know, commas placed where they should be? Do I have citations where they should be? Do I have references that match those citations? And then also reflecting and knowing that you might get to the drafting process and know you've got to go back and realize you got to go back to the pre-writing process. Or you might get to the revising process and realize, you know, I've got solid points on A, B, and C, but I really need to further develop point D, which might mean that you have to go back to the literature to really investigate that further. So it's an iterative process and it's a process that takes time um, across multiple days. So I always encourage students to break up, again, the writing process into manageable chunks. Don't sit down at 7 a.m. on Sunday and say, okay, I have until um, 12.59 p.m. to get this finished because it's just really difficult to do and you will not produce your best work. So part of the pre-writing process that I want to talk about in the context of this assignment specifically is your thesis development. So every paper that you turn in at Walden should have a thesis statement. And honestly, every assignment really that you turn in at Walden should have a thesis statement. So even those small discussion posts, you want to have a thesis statement because all that is is a brief articulation of your paper's central argument and purpose. So this means you are telling your readers, in this paper, I will address X. In this discussion post, I will address, address Y, right? It, it generally is more eloquent like eloquent than that. So we don't sort of say, say, you know, in this paper always. No, it's not saying that you can't, but I think there are other ways to say it. What it is saying is that it's like you shaking your reader's hand and promising that you're going to talk about X or X, Y, and Z in that paper. So the thesis is the most important sentence or set of sentences in your entire draft. Now, your thesis should always be concise, arguable, and specific. So instead of saying something like mobile phone use is being talked about in classrooms today, you know, that's not something that anyone could argue against, right? It's not super specific. What classrooms? What is today, right? And it's not concise, right? There's no way in a five to seven page paper even I could talk about mobile phone use in all classrooms, right? So how can we narrow that? How can we make it more specific? And Meg showed you ways, right, where you do narrow your research and make that more specific. So think about your thesis as sort of replicating that same process of making it more specific. You want to be as specific as possible and terms of telling your readers what your draft is going to be about. And when you write your thesis, you've got to think about scope, right? I have five to seven pages to convey my social problem, the rationale behind that social problem, and the research question um, I've developed that can help address that problem. So your thesis might include some of those elements. Now, for this paper in particular, your thesis statement is probably going to be one, two, or three sentences. So if we're looking at um, Meg's example about bullying, right, I might have um, a general sentence that starts off my introduction about adolescence and bullying. And then with each sentence after that, I'm going to get more narrow and narrow and narrow, narrower and narrower, right, where I talk about 
um, adolescence and bullying uh, and teacher-student relationships, right? And then I might talk about, you know, how the research demonstrates it's a social problem. And then finally, I'm going to talk specifically about um, where I'm intervening, right? Which is um, dealing with adolescence, the bystander effect, uh, teacher-student relationships, um, and bullying. So again, kind of thinking of your introduction as a funnel, your thesis statement should be the smallest end of the funnel. It should be the narrowest, the most specific um, explanation of what your paper is going to be about. Now, after you have drafted a thesis, right, which you, I suggest you do before writing your paper, um, as part of an outlining process, you're going to need to be able to paraphrase evidence, right, because you're going to have to demonstrate um, a rationale for your problem by pulling from the literature. So what's been done, what is yet to be done. Um, incorporating analysis and building synthesis. So a paraphrase is just an articulation of a specific passage or idea in your own words and sentence structure. And we're going to talk a little bit about effective paraphrasing in the coming slides. Analysis then is your explanation, interpretation, connections between, or clarification of evidence. So if a paraphrase is just a reflection of the evidence, the analysis is you telling your readers so what, right? You're giving your readers a takeaway. You're telling your readers why that particular piece of evidence is important within the context of your paper. So if your social problem is about bullying and the bystander effect, right, you're telling your readers why um, this particular piece of evidence is important in terms of how it's related to that problem of bullying. Synthesis then, finally, is using your own words and unique organization to create a new narrative, conclusion, or interpretation based on an analysis of multiple paraphrased details. And synthesis, I think, is the hardest to get your head around, um, but we're going to try to build up to that in the coming slides. So a lot of students get very nervous about paraphrasing. And I always ask students when I go to residencies or when I give webinars, how many of you look at the original passage when they're when you're trying to paraphrase? And students always raise their hands. And the problem is when you look at an original passage when you're trying to paraphrase, it's just human nature to feel like there's no better way to say it. It's so succinct. It's so perfect. I can't figure out any way to change it. So what happens is students do what we call patchwork paraphrasing. They just sort of plug in synonyms and fit it in, um, switch out a few words here and there and call it a day. They call it a paraphrase. But the problem with that is that that actually isn't effective paraphrasing. It kind of leads you down to the road of uh, down the road of unintentional plagiarism. And that's not what you want. And the truth is, if we all witness the same crime in this room and the police asked us each to write a narrative about that crime, would anyone's narrative be the same? No, we would all be describing the same event, but our narratives would all be different because we all sort of come to the table and witness the event with our own set of you know, eyes that, that have experience behind them, baggage that we're bringing to the, the table. And so that's what we're kind of looking for when we say putting things in your own words. You have a unique way of speaking and writing, and that's what we're looking for with your scholarly voice. So the first thing you want to do is to read the original passage to understand. And the way I suggest you test this knowledge is hide the passage, cover it over after you feel like you understand it. Imagine a colleague walks into the room and asks you what you've just read. If you're able to simplify what you've just read and speak it to your colleague, chances are you understand it. If you're not able to do that, you need to go back to step one because you need to make sure you want to read it to understand. Now again, going back to scholarly writing, sometimes being wordy, sometimes being full of jargon. This isn't going to come to us always, this understanding isn't going to come to us always upon first reading, right? Sometimes we're going to have to read it multiple times. Sometimes we're going to have to look up words or terms we don't understand. That is to be expected, especially if you're looking at a new topic you haven't explored before. So know that some of that is part of the process, and it really is necessary to an effective paraphrase. Now, after you've read it to understand, and if you're able to speak it to this imaginary colleague, you want to then write it in your own words, still with the original covered. Um, and after you've got a paraphrase you're happy with, you're going to compare it with the original. So when you compare it to the original, you want to look for borrowed phrasing. Sometimes phrasing is too specific um, to paraphrase successfully, so you might need to provide quotation marks around that. 
Um, so if you do have any borrowed phrasing, you want to make sure that's cited as a direct quotation. And then finally, you want to cite. Please, please, please don't wait to cite until after your paper is completed. It's hard to remember what's yours and what's from an outside source if you do that. So go ahead and when you get that paraphrase down, cite it. And you know, with the paraphrase, your citation is just going to be the author's name, the author's last name, um, and the year of publication. So here's an example of effective paraphrasing. So um, this is from the American Heart Association website. Quote, there are countless physical activities out there, but walking has the lowest dropout rate of them all. It's the simplest positive change you can make to effectively improve your heart health. Um, so here's one example of a paraphrase. Of all the ways to get phys physical exercise, walking is one that people continue long term. So let's say I'm talking about um, particular effects of long-term exercise. This is what my paraphrase might look like for that draft. People can easily improve their heart health by walking. So this paraphrase might change if the topic of my paper changes, right? So let's say in this other paper, I'm writing about heart health specifically. So you'll see here in my paraphrase that I'm actually not focused on the longevity of the exercise. Instead, I'm focused on how um, exercising can improve heart health. And then finally, the last paraphrase, although people can improve their physical fitness in many ways, one easy improvement that the American Heart Association reported um, people persist in the most is walking. So again, this might be sort of various kinds of exercise that can um, improve um, physical fitness. So you'll see that each of these paraphrases accurately reflect the direct quotation above, but they shift based on what my overall topic is. Now, I always say that you should use paraphrases um, as opposed to direct quotations when possible because you see how you can actually take the evidence and sort of mold it to fit within your particular topic or paper, right, when you're putting it in your own words. And you can't do that with a direct quotation. When you have a direct quotation, you kind of have to take it as it is, right? Um, so paraphrasing is useful because when you put it in your own words, you can also craft it to fit within the narrative or the scope of your particular paper. So when you are doing this process of paraphrasing, you are going to do this for multiple sources, right? In this case, you're going to do it for five. So you're going to repeat the process of paraphrasing for multiple sources and ideas. And then synthesis actually results from analyzing these paraphrases from multiple sources. So let's look at two examples of um, two paraphrases that I've pulled, okay? So number one, of all the ways you can get physical exercise, walking is one that people continue long term. So that's my first paraphrase. My second is, however, in the small Wisconsin community she surveyed, Prince found that community leaders usually recommend group physical activities that result in short-term weight loss. So how do I put these two paraphrases together um, to create analysis and synthesis? Um, so what I would do is make sure that you're answering the so what question, okay? So if I'm putting A and B together, those are my two paraphrases, um, I want to make sure I answer why is this information important? What does it mean? And why should your readers care about this information? And what does this information show or tell us? And your so what is going to be important, right? Because you've got to rationalize or justify why your particular problem is a social problem. And you also have to rationalize or justify that this is actually a gap in the literature. And you've got to do that twice, right? So this so what or this analysis that you're going to be creating is going to lean heavily on that um, uh, rationale for um, the problem as an actual social problem and the fact that that does exist as a gap in the current literature. So if my thesis is walking a few times a week is a useful exercise for combating obesity and depression in small communities, a paragraph that uses this sample analysis might look as follows. Because physical exercise and social support are proven ways to reduce rates of depression and obesity, communities should implement programs that provide both. And the next step is, um, are my two pieces of evidence. Of all the ways to get physical exercise, walking is one that people continue long term. However, in the small Wisconsin community she surveyed, Prince found that community leaders usually recommend group physical activities that result in sh short term weight loss. So here at the end, you'll see my analysis. This is how I'm connecting those two pieces of the puzzle. 
To ensure long-term weight loss and reduce rates of depression, future researchers should explore community-sponsored group walking programs as a means of providing social encouragement and enduring commitment to exercise. So again, I'm saying there's been research on X, there's been research on Y, but future research should address X and Y together, right? And so that is my analysis. Now this analysis, what is answering that so what question, functions as synthesis here because I'm combining multiple sources. So you can have analysis of one source, but if you have analysis of multiple sources, you've created synthesis. So again, synthesis is using your own words and unique organization to create a new narrative, conclusion, or interpretation based on analysis of multiple paraphrase details. So if you imagine that each one of those paraphrases, right, is a discrete separate piece of information. So each of those dots there on the screen is a discrete paraphrase that you've got. Then you're going to build in your analysis, your interpretation, and your evaluation, right? So you're going to tell us why it's important. You're going to answer that so what question for your readers. And what you're ultimately going to get is a new idea, perspective, or conclusion. And your conclusion for this assignment in particular is that X, right, is an important research question for future researchers to address. So again, step one is pulling those discrete paraphrases. Step two is analyzing those for your readers, thinking about the so what, which ultimately will lead us to step three, which is a new idea, perspective, or conclusion. So another way to think about synthesis is after you finish this draft, um, you're going to have what we call global synthesis. So imagine that each of the five articles that you pull, you invite the authors of each of those five articles to your uh, house for dinner. Now you give them wine and food and you say, you know, hey guys, let's talk about bullying um, in the context, or let's talk about adolescent bullying in the context of um, uh, student-teacher relationships. And um, I'm trying to remember that last. Bystander effect. Yeah, there you go, bystander effect. Um, and so you invite them over, right? And so you're and you, and you say, you know, let's talk about it. Now, what's going to happen if you bring all of those experts in the field over to your house for a dinner party? It's not going to be that author A stands up, gives her spiel, sits down, and then author B stands up, gives her spiel, and sits down, and so on and so forth. Instead, you might say, let's talk about adolescence, bullying, and the bystander effect in terms of uh, classroom dynamics. And author A might say. Well, you know, the main culprit is actually uh, teacher observation. So when teachers don't pay attention, X, Y, and Z happens. And author B might stand up and say, or not stand up, she might say, you know, I absolutely disagree with you. I think teachers don't have anything to do with bullying interactions in the classroom. You know, peer-to-peer -peer relationships are so strong for adolescents, they don't really care what their teachers are doing. And author C might say, well, you know, I kind of see that author A has a point and author B has a point. I think we could probably meld both of these ideas and come up with um, some middle ground here. So, you know, when you have this dinner party conversation, authors are going to agree. They're going to disagree, right? They might partially agree. So, again, that's your job when you're synthesizing these articles, right? When you're synth synthesizing the ideas within these articles, you want to relate um, what these articles, uh, the ideas within these articles. And you want to organize by uh, those ideas, thinking about, you know, what particular ideas come up in all of the sources or all of the articles. You know, who is talking about X, Y, and Z? Well, if they're all talking about it, it's probably important. And also not providing just a summary of the first article, a summary of the second article, a summary of the third article. You never want to see that, right? That does not make for good synthesis. Instead, you want to organize by ideas. Think about the ideas that are coming up. And then in each paragraph, relate those ideas between authors, right? Um, that is how we create synthesis. So again, global level synthesis is not only created by successfully connecting ideas in paragraphs and sec sections, you want to think about the paper as a whole. So for instance, just like, you know, if I've got a puzzle, right? Um, all of those puzzle pieces don't mean anything on their own. It's only when I finish the puzzle, I put all the puzzle pieces together, do I get a picture, right? 
The same is true for your narrative. You cannot just provide the disparate pieces of evidence and hope that your readers are going to connect the dots on their own. They're not, okay? Instead, you have to put those puzzle pieces together for your reader and tell them what the picture is, right? Sort of explain what you're trying to convey. And that illustration really comes from you and how you construct the pieces. And when I say pieces, I mean those individual pieces of evidence, your paraphrases. And then your goal is really to create a cohesive narrative in your text. And you can do this by throughout reasserting those main ideas, organizing by themes. You can use clear transitions between paragraphs and sections. If you're uncomfortable with transitions or you tend to use the same transitions over and over, the Writing Center has a transitions page that details a whole host of transitions. Um, and also, if, if you like, you could also use clear and logical headings to kind of drive or steer your reader, which I think is important. Um, so on the paragraph level, uh, you can create synthesis by uh, what we call meal plan paragraphs. So those are paragraphs that have a main idea sentence to start with. And just like your thesis statement is sort of the main idea for your entire paper, your topic sentence is the main idea for individual paragraphs. So again, your topic sentence is like you shaking, hand with your, shaking hands with your readers and saying, in this paragraph, I promise to talk about X. And then what I call the meat of the paragraph, really the middle parts, right, is your evidence and analysis. And so your evidence, again, is those individual paraphrases, and your analysis answers that so what question. And then finally, for each paragraph, you want to have a nice lead out. So that's just a wrap-up sentence. Um, and it can lead your reader into the next paragraph. But more importantly, it needs to sort of tie a bow on that uh, paragraph and let your readers know that you're sort of concluding that idea and moving forward to the next idea. Now, I just want to say really briefly that you don't want each of your paragraphs to set, to be formatted as M-E-A-L, M-E-A-L, because that's repetitive and sometimes that can become distracting to readers. So you don't have to follow the guideline that rigidly. Instead, you might have a paragraph that's M-E-E-A-L, M-E-A-E-A-L. The idea is that your evidence and analysis are going to go in the middle, but you know this is the loose way that your paragraphs are going to look. But it is important that all of these elements exist in each of your paragraphs. So here's an example of a meal plan paragraph. You'll see my main topic sentence is in red. Because physical exercise and social support are proven ways to reduce rates of depression and obesity, communities should implement programs that provide both. And then you'll see of all the ways to get physical exercise, et cetera. Those are my two pieces of paraphrased information. Um, and then you'll see I've got however and my analysis at the bottom in purple because however also functions as analysis here. I'm showing how those two pieces of evidence are related, right? That however is kind of drawing a distinction between or shifting between those two pieces of evidence. And then finally, in this case, my analysis and my lead out actually function in the same sentence. So I'm closing out the paragraph and providing analysis in that same uh, final sentence. So I know I just breezed through the foundations of scholarly writing. Um, I just wanted to hit the high notes. If you have any questions, you're welcome to email us at writingsupport at waldenu.edu. But I do just want to spend a couple of minutes now talking about APA formatting, um, particularly citations and references. So I've highlighted um, our web pages, modules, and other resources about APA specifically. I'm not going to go through those here uh, now, but these are on uh, the uh, PowerPoint and their active links if you download the PowerPoint. So make sure to check those out. Uh, so let's briefly talk about the sections of a reference entry. All of your APA reference entries are going to start with the author's last name. Okay. Now that is true unless you have an organizational author like the CDC. And if that's the case, you're going to put the organization's name instead. So the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention would sit in that author spot. Then you're going to have the publication date. Generally, that is just a year. That'll be in parentheses. Then you have the title of the source and the publication information. Now, I bolded publication information because this really changes based on the type of source you use. Now, you all are going to be using journal articles, um, and those are electronic journal articles, right, because you're retrieving those from the library's databases. Now, what's important is that journal articles 
need to have retrieval information if you access them online. That retrieval information is not the database where you access that journal article because that is not where that journal article lives. Instead, you want to provide a DOI. A DOI stands for Digital Object Identifier, and it's basically like a social security uh, number for all journal articles. So just like all US citizens have a social security number, all articles published, well, I, sh I should say most articles published that are peer reviewed have a digital object identifier. Now, not all of them have a digital object identifier, but that is the gold standard. So you're looking for that digital object identifier first. Now, if you cannot find it on the, um, the journal's homepage or within the database, sometimes it is located there, you can always do a quick free check for a DOI by going to crossref.org backslash guest query. So you'll see that um, on the right side of the screen. That's a really handy tool if you just want to double check there. Um, if there is no DOI, so let's say you've checked Crossref, you see that there is no DOI, you want to then go to the second option, which is to search for the journal's homepage. Now, you do not have to find the exact place where the journal article lives, all right? You don't have to go that far. You just provide the journal's homepage. So, for instance, if I got a journal from uh, National Teachers Association and their homepage is nationalteachersassociation.org, I'm just going to write retrieved from nationalteachersassociation.org, right? I'll have the HTTP, et cetera. But I do not need to find the particular journal article on that homepage and then provide that URL. I don't have to take that step. So again, gold standard is to find the DOI. If you can't find the DOI on the actual article's cover page or within the database, right, you could then go to crossref.org, do a quick search. If you do not find a DOI through that search, you want to use retrieve from the journal's homepage. So once you have formatted your reference, you're going to make sure that each of your citations is also formatted correctly. Now there's two kinds of citations that you can use in your draft. I highly recommend that you vary between both. The first kind of citation is what we call a narrative citation, and that means that both um, that the author's names are part of the narrative of the sentence, meaning that your sentence would not make grammatical sense without the author's names. So here we have Oyo and Kalima noted that quote, right? So we have um, a narrative citation here. You'll notice that the year of publication directly follows the author's names, but because this is a direct quotation, the page on which we found that direct quotation is after the quotation itself. And then we have what we call a parenthetical citation, which is just a fancy way to say all citation elements are within the parentheses of the citation. So in Africa, massive online courses are currently popular. Your COO and Kalima is in the parentheses of the citation. So again, both of these are acceptable, but you want to make sure you have a citation for each and every sentence that includes information or ideas from an outside source. Um, so I just breezed through that. Um, I'd love to talk more. And if you have questions, you're welcome to email us at writingsupport at waldenu.edu. Uh, and the Writing Center also has a chat function. And so if we are online, we would love to chat with you about this particular assignment if you have writing questions. So with that, Meg, I realize I have left us woefully short on time to answer questions, but I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thanks. Yeah, I, no, I think you did a really good job. I definitely learned a whole lot today. <laughs> um, let me just really quick, quickly, there were no questions that came into the questions box. Um, I'll give you guys just another minute or two if you do have anything that you would like to ask us. Um, if not, let's see, I sh you should be seeing my screen now. And I'm going to show you really quickly on the library homepage where to go to get more help if you do have a question or if you think of a question later. Um, the first place that I want you to think about going to get help is the um, question, quick answers that we have. So the, the way you get to quick answers is to click search everything on the library homepage and then type in your just a couple keywords related to your question. So for example, if you want to double check and make sure that what you found is in fact peer review, you could do a search for it and then here are our quick answers. These are really great short direct answers to your questions um, that you know you can get right away. You don't have to wait for anybody. Um, and most of the time you will be able to learn what you need to know just by looking at this. We have 
nice little screen caps. Um, sometimes we'll even have a little short, super, super short video down here to help you through that process. If you're still stuck, um, if you look at quick answers and you're still not sure, why don't you send us a note at Ask a Librarian? We have a couple different ways that you can get in touch with us. You can use the email form that's right here. You can use um, chat. We do have chat hours available now. Um, and you can also call us and leave a voicemail, and then we will get back to you um, through your Walden email. Um, and we really do try to get back to everybody within 24 business hours, uh, but honestly, it's it's so much faster than that. So um, definitely have a look at that. If you want to have a look at some of our recorded webinars, they are under the Get Help button, as well as um, library skill guides, tutorials, um, but here's our webinar archive. So if you found this session helpful, then you might be the kind of learner who really does well with you know, videos and, and talking things through. We have a whole archive on just general library skills, um, but we also have our archived uh, webinars that are specifically to speaking to psychology research, and you'll find those here. Um, again, I'll go back to the library homepage and show you where all this is. Okay, so quick answers, click search everything, type your keywords in here, ask a librarian is up here in this corner, and then the webinar archive is under get help. So let's see if there are any last minute questions. I don't see anyone, any, so thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I hope that this has been helpful. I hope it's been a really practical um, explanation of how to do this social psychology assignment. We wish we both wish you good luck on your paper. Please read out, reach out to us if you need any help. And I wish you all a good night.